But Father, we thank you today for what you'll say to us. Speak through me. Think through my mind. May revelation knowledge flow freely with no hindrances whatsoever. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Say with me, I will receive, I will receive the, word of God the Word of God with revelation, with revelation. Right, now, right now in Jesus' name. Give God praise for the word. Give him praise for the word. What we're learning is highly practical, and I'm just very interested in how you are applying it in terms of imagination, in terms of what it is that God is speaking to your heart, what it is that, that, you're, that you're being caused to see. We know that God speaks, and he speaks so that we may see. And that happens as we apply pressure to that word that he speaks. That pressure we call meditation, or that process we call meditation. It is a process whereby an image is built over time based on a word that he speaks. Now, what we also have learned is that there is a, an imagination that is not of spirit influence. It's called a vain imagination. That vain imagination is one that is going forth a process of meditating something that God didn't say. It's just something somebody else said, the devil said, or you conjured up in your own carnal, natural mind. The imagination wasn't meant for that. The imagination was meant to house and to embrace the word of God, causing you to see an image of his word so that you may step out into it and be it or do it. So we say that when this happens, it creates what we call vision. And then when vision is settled inside of you, it causes you to operate at a place that... Um, you was not able to operate at before that, that word matured. It causes you to see things that you couldn't see before or that someone next to you can't see. And then, of course, it causes you to do things that others can't do or that you couldn't do before. You just couldn't do it. Just couldn't do it. And now you're doing it. And you can do what you can't do. Sometimes people will say, I'm trying my best, but sometimes your best is not enough. It doesn't solve the problem. The problem still remains, even though you have, you've released your best effort. So you have more than your best available to you. You have God's ability available to you so that you can operate above and beyond your ability, even your best ability. God's ability can take up from there and do something through you you couldn't do. Before That's why the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that our strength is, it should be strength derived from God. Be strong in the Lord. Six, Ephesians 6 and 10. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the power of his might. Through your union with him, draw your strength, not from you, draw your strength from him which is strength, which his boundless might provides. There's no end to his ability. So there are some things you're facing right now you can't do. You can't do in and of yourself. You need help right now. You need help to get to the next place. You need help to press through that, that, that place where you are, and, and you've tried everything you can do, and you can't do it. But you have more than you. You have God. Come on, say, I have God. I have God. And where is God? In He's in you right now. He's within you right now. You don't have to depend on the God in the sky. You can depend on the God in you. And the moment you surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, he came right on in and took up habitation inside of you. Now give the Lord praise for the God that lives within you. This is why we say greater is he that's in me. We're talking about God in you than he or the circumstance that is in the world. So today I want to talk to you about what's the big idea because 
I'm telling you, when God talks, he does, he does not speak on terms of smallness. God doesn't think small. He doesn't do small. He doesn't act small in any way. Let's go and establish that with a very familiar passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 in the Amplified Translation. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 in the Amplified. Now to him, him is God, who by in consequence of the action of his power is at work where? Say God is at work, God is at work. Inside, of me. inside of me. Now that's where it's happening. Yes, sir. Amen. Let, me, let me say it this way. That's either where it's happening or where it's not happening. But the only place God is designed to work now that you are in Christ is in you. He's not working in the sky for you. God, do you hear me? What are you talking about? God, I'm in you. Of course I hear you. Do you hear me? I'm in you. Stop, stop. No, he's, he's within you and he's working within you. Now, what that means is, is that God, the potential within you is for God to work within you. But now God is not going to work within you without your permission. If you shut down on him in your thoughts and in your mind, he is not going to work within you. God, make me stop. I don't do that. God, make me do this or make me do that. God, don't do that. that. That's a violation of his process. He works within you. And, and primarily, that's because of Christ. That's because of Christ. So now, it's not God do this with me or God do this in me or God do this for me. It's, it's God, I surrender and I allow you to work within me the promise and the fulfillment of your word. It says, now in the consequence of the action of his power that is at work within us, he's able. When is he able? When he's able to work in you. If he's not able, if he's not going to be, if he's not, if you're not allowing him to work in you, he's not able to do the rest of what we're getting ready to see. Are oh, y'all getting this? No, I'm, I'm not going to be rushed. I'm just going to take my time. And, I mean, I got to go, but I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be rushed in trying to give you all this, what I have, if you're not getting what I'm telling you right now. Ain't no need me trying to give you the other stuff. If you can't get this. So God says, I'm not going to do nothing for you, through you, to you. Let me say it again. There's another way. I can't, I'm, I'm not doing anything for you or to you that I can't do through you. I got to do it through you. I can't do it for you if I can't do it through you. I can't do, I can't do for you without you. So how does that work? How does that work? Let's, let's finish this and let, then we'll look at how does that work. He says, now here's what I'm capable of. Here's my ability. Here's the description of my ability. Super abundantly. Say super abundantly. Super abundantly. Far over. Say far over. Above, say above. above. Now that is the characteristic of God's ability. There's nothing small, little bit, just enough, none of that. God says, you want to know how I do it? This is how I do it. This is, this, this is a way you can characterize my ability. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Here's my might. Here's the characteristic of my might. Super abundantly far over and above. If you ask me for a little bit, I don't know what that means. I can't do that. Now, that's my, that might be what you are getting, 
but that's not what he's doing. And if you're getting a little bit, that's only because he can only get a little bit through you. God, when are you going to give me more? When you can let me bring more through you. I mean, I just pray, I just ask God, God, when is the, when is the boom? When is, when it, when it, when everything drops? When is it, when it just, when is the explosion? He said, when I can explode through you. I said, oh, okay. See, what we're talking about here is capacity. And the imagination places a demand on your capacity. It says you, you have to widen your capacity if you're going to think with me and imagine with me because God says, I'm dreaming, but I'm dreaming through you. He says, I'm imagining still God, but I'm imagining through you. And if there's a word you, will, you could write by this scripture in your Bible, if you do that, you could write the word capacity. You also could write the word development. Because this is a process that we're talking about that God develops us and builds us out. And he builds us out by his word working in us. And if the word is not working in you, there's no development going on in you. There's no build out happening in your life. And so what does it mean to work the word? It just simply means to grab hold of a word that God gives you and rehearse that thing in your heart. It don't mean read the whole Bible in a year. It don't mean to read a chapter a night. It just means take a seed. Take one scripture. You can take one scripture and it'll change your world. You can take that one scripture for a year. It'll change your life. One. That's not enough. Well, where is the fruit of that one scripture in your life? Where is the demonstration of that scripture? Let me see where that scripture has been lived out in your life. Then tell me it's not enough. Because the word is not meant to be dictated as much as it's meant to be demonstrated. So where is the demonstration of that word? Then you can say, I want more. Pastor, I think you, had, you read that scripture three weeks ago. Well, listen to it again. And let me see the fruit of that scripture in your life. Praise the Lord. I'm not upset. Do I sound upset? Okay, I'm not upset. I'm just passionate. I'm passionate about you getting this and learning this and understanding this. Amen. He says, infinitely unlimited, without boundaries beyond your highest request or prayers, desires. You can't even think this high. I will always outdream you. You won't bankrupt God. You won't bankrupt God. See, if a run out mentality has been seeded in us, we would think that there are certain levels that we can't ask God. We can't request because it, there may not be enough. I may be taken from something else if I ask for that. God's like, what are you talking about? There's no limit to my supply. There's no boundary to what I'm capable of doing. He says, ask me for something big. My, my, my desire today is to provoke you to think big and to ask big and to see big. And to dream big. And somebody says, man, you know, that sounds greedy. See, that's a small mind saying that. 
That's a small mind saying that. Because it's not greed. Greed is about motive. It's growth. It's growth. And when your motive is right, big is a response to growth. Not greed. If you understand that, give the Lord praise. Say to somebody, I'm a big thinker. thinker. Say, I'm a big receiver. receiver. I have big ideas. ideas. Let's go to Isaiah 54 and verse 1. Isaiah 54 and verse 1 in the Amplified Translation, please. Isaiah 54 and verse 1. Now, he's talking here prophetically to Israel who had spiritually, in a spiritual sense, been barren, meaning not giving birth to anything. And many times in our lives, we go through seasons where we're barren. We're not giving birth to new things. Things are being aborted. Because we have disqualified ourselves. Because we have allowed ourselves to see ourselves in a way that doesn't reflect the way God sees us. Because of stuff. Because of circumstances. Because of life. Because of events. And I just showed you in Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, God says, I don't take that stuff and change my mind about you. And I don't take that stuff and change my mind about what I put inside of you. So it shouldn't have any effect on his plan and purposes for your life. So you stay with the dream, you stay with the assignment, and it'll realign you. It'll bring, see, the thing, when you go wild, or when you go west, or when you go left, y'all know what I'm talking about? The thing that recenters you is the assignment. The thing that has the most power to bring back your focus is the thing that you were put on the earth to do. It's the word that God gave you and you thought it was too good for you. That's the very word you need to bring you back to a centered place. Because it comes with purpose. It comes, it comes with drive. And so prophetically here, Israel was living a barren life. And now the word is going to them. It's being prophesied back to them. Now it's time to give birth. Your barren days are over. And I'm declaring that to you today that your barren days are over. They're over. Come on, receive it. It's prophetic. Say it, my barren days are over. over. Now, if you want homework, you need to say that all week. And get that in your spirit. My barren days are over. My dreams are coming to pass. The things that God showed me five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years back, they're coming forth. There's going to be a resurrection in your life in 2019. Your barren days are over. Say it again. My barren days are over. So he says, shout for joy. Shout for joy. Is that the Amplified? Old scene, man. Okay, old scene. Put it in the King James. I must be in the King James. Shout for joy, O barren one. She who has not given birth. Break forth into joyful shouting and rejoice. You see, the attitude is that you have to provoke this. God has already seated you. He's already put everything in you. There's nothing else he can do for you that he hadn't already done. It's just a matter of you now embracing and receiving and and getting up out of that, that place of despair that you've been in and deciding, you know what? It's time. My barren days are over. I will shout for joy. I will sing. I will give God praise. 
and give him glory. Something good is getting ready to happen to me. Things are getting ready to turn around and I decree it now. Say it, my barren days are over. He says, shout for joy, O barren one who has not given birth. Break forth into joyful shouting and rejoice. She who has not gone into labor with child for the spiritual sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. Maybe this is in the uh, Message Bible in verse 2. I'm going to look at it in the message anyway. Clear lots of ground. Everybody say, get ready. Because your tent is going to be big. Make large tents and make large tents on purpose. What is he saying? Make big plans. Spread out. In other words, think outside the box of your limitation. Think outside the box of your past experiences. Spread out. He says, think big. Use plenty of rope. Drive the tent pegs deep. Next. You're going to see, you're going to need lots of elbow room for your growing family. Say, I'm about to give birth. You're going to take over the whole nations. That means your name's going to be great. That means he's going to give you favor. That means he, his people are going to know who you are. He says, you're going to resettle, abandon the cities. So, I want to suggest to you that you've been thinking too small. I want to suggest to us that we've been thinking too small. We have to stir ourselves up to the place where God thinks. What's the big idea? What's the big idea? Now let's go to Isaiah 55 in verse 6. Isaiah 55 in verse 6 in the Amplified or the King James, it, it doesn't matter. Amplified, I guess. Seek, inquire for, and require the Lord while he may be found. What's he saying? You have access. You have access to the Father. You have access to his wisdom. You have access to revelation. You have access to divine protection. You have access to the Holy Spirit. You have access to peace. You have access to joy. He says, seek the Lord. He says, inquire of him and require the Lord. Why you can Claiming him by necessity. Not just because you need him, but because you have a right to call on him. He says, call on him while he is near. Next verse. Then he goes on, he says, so let the wicked forsake his way. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. Now, there are two categories of people identified here. Who are they? The wicked. Come on. And the righteous. Say it again. Who? The wicked. So who is he talking to? The wicked and the righteous. Let him return to the Lord and he will have love. God will have pity. God will have mercy for him. And let him return to our God for he will multiply him his abundant pardon. Doesn't that sound like God is ready to forgive? Next verse. He says, for my thoughts are not on the level of the thoughts of the unrighteous. That's who he's talking to, the wicked 
and the unrighteous. My ways are not on the level of the ways of the wicked. But something has happened here in that you have been redeemed. By the blood of Jesus, and you cannot be wicked, and you cannot be unrighteous. So, he's not talking to you because you're not the wicked and you're not the unrighteous. What's he saying here? My thoughts are not on the level of unrighteous thought life, unrighteous thought pattern. So when you, the righteous, come down to the level of unrighteous thinking, you have just dropped out of your place of thinking with God because you're not thinking on the level of your identity. You're thinking now on a level below your identity. And because as your thoughts go, your ways go. So if I have, if I embrace unrighteous thoughts, I'm going to create wicked ways or a wicked way of life. Wicked don't mean you're just doing sinful things. Wicked means sinful things happen, things that shouldn't be happening to you are happening to you. You're living without the privileges and the benefits of things that have been already provided for you. And he says, you're not supposed to be living like that. That's not supposed to be happening to you. He says it's happening to you, not because the devil's doing it, not because God is withholding. It's happening to you because that's where you see yourself. That's where you're thinking. And if you're thinking there, you're speaking there. And if you're speaking there, you're creating there. He says, you possess the power to turn it all around. Come back to your identity. Come back to a place of righteousness. That's what you are. That's who you are. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He says, come back to righteousness. Think righteous. Speak righteous. Create righteous. And your ways will represent righteousness. You want to know how far and how separated one becomes when he or she drops out of righteous thinking as far as the heavens are from the earth. As far as the heavens are higher than the earth. That's how far you drop down. When you drop out of your righteousness and you start adapting to the world. Take me to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Say, I have big ideas. Have big ideas. Look at this. He says, now this is Paul writing, and listen, he's not writing to sinners. He's writing to Christians. He's writing to the church. He says, don't be conformed to this world. Wait, right there. What does that say? You're not like the world. Right there, it says you are distinct from the world. Right there, it says your identity is different and distinct from the world. He says, now don't be conformed. The word conformed means don't, don't become, I call it camouflaged. You're so camouflaged, nobody can tell you apart from the world. You're so camouflaged, you can walk right up into a gang of sinners and they think you want to. Some people say, well, you know, you know, I just want to slide over there and undercover. And no, you can't be undercover. There ain't no such thing as you being undercover. Jesus says you're the light of the world. He says ain't no way you can take a city on the top of a hill and hide it. So you can't be undercover. You're going to show up. You're going to shine everywhere you go. Everybody's going to know, oh, whoa, wait a minute. Something's different. He says, don't be conformed. So this tells me, obviously, I can dim my light. I can hide my shine. When my thinking is disconnected from the thinking of the Father. 
He says, what will happen is you become fashioned after them. You start adapting yourself to them. And you will look like them. You'll lose a sense of who you are after a while. He says, but be transformed. In other words, stay consistently changed. And the way that happens, you keep your mind under a state of renewal constantly, constantly. And you live by the way of your new minds, new ideas, its new attitude, so that you may demonstrate, that you may prove for yourself what is the good, the perfect, and the acceptable will of the Father. Next slide, please. He says, so don't become, don't slip down. So I call this high-thought imagination. <laughs> high-thought. High-thought. Now, you have opportunity for low thought, for low thinking, all day, every day, by an abundance of people who don't know what you know coming around you. You have to take that low, that low thinking and you have, to, you have to stay up above it. You can't let low thinking bring you low. You have to regulate low thinking so you can stay high. 